So how many of you have smartphones? Is there anybody in here who doesn't have a smartphone? Okay, a few of you. Well, in about 10 years, 6 billion humans are going to have smartphones, and the smartphones they're going to be carrying are going to make the smartphones of today look like the Motorola briefcase phones that some of us who are over the age of 30 were carrying 10, or 10 years ago. That connected humanity has huge implications. During the protests in Egypt, and this is Tahir Square, many Egyptians were following the protests online, keeping track of the, uh, the, the riots, the actions of the government. And at some point during the protests, Mubarak, realizing that the protests were actually being fueled to a large degree by organizing on the internet, and that the images from the protests were being made available all around the world, ordered Vodafone, a European Union company, to shut off the internet. And what happened was, was just like what would happen here if the internet was shut off or if we were to lose electricity, those people who were following the protests at home went out into the streets, swelling the protests because they were actually trying to find out what was going on. A young sociologist from the University of Texas by the name of Dave Parry, writing about this, wrote the following uh, blog post that had the following line. You can shut off the public internet, but you cannot shut off the internet public. Now, if you're a member of the internet public, it has nothing to do with your age, although it does skew younger. It has to do with the fact that you consider the internet central to your life, either economically, politically, spiritually, culturally, or even emotionally. And you can see the DNA of this emerging class of human across the planet in things like the SOPA and PIPA protests or the ACTA protests, which are shown here all over Europe, in the popular protests in Israel, in the way the Kony 2012 video distributed itself around the world, and how organizers associated with Planned Parenthood fought back Susan G. Komen's cutting back of their funding. We even see it in places like where Russian bloggers were fighting for the civil rights of Pussy Riot. And even in China, where you would think that the censors would not allow free speech, young Chine Chinese citizens, in solidarity with Chen Guangchen when he was fighting to come to the United States, posted pictures of themselves wearing sunglasses on the internet. And you even see it in Gangnam Style, over a billion views. But it's not just about fighting and saying no. It's also about building things and saying yes. The National Endowment for the Arts last year had a budget of $146 million and Kickstarter, which was the platform that allows for crowdsourcing of funding, had raised $320 million. This is a map of Haiti on a platform called Yushahidi, and a young woman in Kenya during the 2007 uh, post-election riots that were uh, happening in anger at the government for having stolen the election, reached out to some technologists and asked them to help her build a platform that would allow Kenyans to use text messaging to post uh, incidents of violence on a map in a way that the world would be able to see that the violence was happening because much, much of the international community was not putting any pressure on the Kenyan government to stop their crackdown on the protesters. Not only did her platform work and bring international press pressure on the Kenyan government to reduce the violence, but the, map that sh the mapping system they created is now used in places like Haiti for mapping, it, mapping the after effects of an earthquake or forest fires in California even finding parking spaces during snowstorms in Chicago or New York or Washington, D.C. And some of this technology, technology is allowing us to do Jimmy Carter election monitoring on steroids. Um, people using Twitter to basically report long lines or broken voting machines all around the country and now around the world. 
But let me ask you another question. How many of you have actually read the terms of service on any application or website all the way through before you clicked agree? Seriously. Anybody here? One or two people. And have you done it for everyone? Just Instagram. <laughs> well, do you have any idea what you're giving away? Have you asked yourself a question, what is your personal responsibility in making sure that the world is a safer place when you're connecting yourself to all these servers that are controlled by companies that you don't actually know who runs them? That are basically putting money into the pockets of politicians who either regulate or don't regulate them? After the SOPA and PIPA protests, there were a lot of people who were all asking the question about how the internet would be used for freedom of expression or for the search for liberty. But many of them organized themselves afterwards and started fighting for something called the Declaration of Internet Freedom. And this idea basically presents the notion that somehow if we had an open and free internet, that we might be able to have an open and free democracy. There's two problems with that theory. One is, is that we actually don't have an open and free internet. It's a myth. The internet is controlled by multinational corporations that control access, control the pricing, control the speed, and also are sharing their data about us with the governments without our knowledge or certainly without our oversight. We want democracy, but we don't realize that we don't actually have an open democracy. We think we have an open democracy. It's sort of a myth in this country. And the problem with the open internet as a tool for an open democracy is that our existing political system does not want an open internet because it's like a foreign object. It takes away power from those who have it. It allows many voices to participate. It, it creates a currency, of, a, net, a currency of networks as opposed to a currency of money. So if we really want to have an open internet, if we really want to have an, an open society and an egalitarian world, we have to start thinking about attacking democracy myth about openness because we have far too much influence of money in politics. We gerrymander our districts to the point where we actually don't elect our elected leaders. They choose us. We have an electoral college that has mutated our political process to the battle over six or seven states where Obama has to spend millions of dollars hiring geeks to basically do data analytics in order to, uh, in effect, game the political process in a way that will make sure that his message gets through to the five or six percent of the people who hadn't decided who they're going to vote for. But yet we're still leaving out 45 percent of the population who just don't show up at the polls. Or the fact that we vote on Tuesdays or that we make it really hard for people to register to vote. Does anybody know why we vote on Tuesdays? The reason why we vote on Tuesdays is because it was market day. And when our country was founded, the people who actually had the right to vote were mostly farmers who came into town on Tuesdays because that was the day when the, most of them were in the town square. We have an antique voting system in this country that needs to make sure that every single voter and every single citizen has a voice and has access without having to stand in line or, or um, fight to prove that they have a right to vote. So if we really want to go to a place where we are empowered by this, to a place where we can actually change the world, we have to get past our past. You never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. This is my challenge to you. The future is yours. Let's build that new model. Thank you very much.